Hello, Honors Physics. Um, I'm going to talk through some of the slides that I posted on Google Classroom. So if you want to hear me talk about it, instead of just reading it, here you go. Um, we are starting into the topic of magnetism. Magnetism is related to electricity, um, and it's going to feel most similar to electrostatics rather than like current and circuits and stuff, but they're all related to each other. Um, so the first thing is that just like uh, we talked about electric fields in uh, a couple chapters back, we're gonna be talking about magnetic fields now. The letter that we use for magnetic fields is a capital B, and I don't have a good explanation for that, um, but that's the letter that we're going to be using. With electric fields, it was a capital E, which kind of makes sense. Um, but we use a B instead for magnetism. The primary unit for magnetic fields is called the Tesla, and the symbol for that is a capital T. However, the Tesla is an impractically large unit. It's really uncommon to run into a magnetic field with that kind of intensity, um, which is similar to how like one coulomb of charge is a whole lot of charge, one amp of current is a whole lot of current. So similarly, one Tesla is a very strong field. So in practice, if you are like uh, looking at the magnetic fields that you run into in everyday life, either from like actual little permanent magnets um, or magnetic fields produced by various electronic devices and that sort of thing. They're usually gonna be measured in a different unit called a Gauss. Um, and the symbol for a Gauss is a capital G. And as you can see here, it takes 10,000 Gauss to make one Tesla. Um, the Gauss works nicely with centimeters and grams, as opposed to the Tesla, which works nicely with meters and kilograms. Um, and so that's another reason that you'll often run into the Gauss people in certain industries, at least. They like to measure things with centimeters and grams instead of meters and kilograms. So anyway, um, the existence of magnetic fields is related to the motion of electric charges. So if you have like an electron just sitting there in space, not doing anything, it has an electric field that radiates off from it in all directions. Um, but if that electron is in motion, then it will also have a magnetic field that it produces. Um, now that is a little bit of a simplification because in truth, even when the electron is motionless, it still has what we call a magnetic moment. Um, and the magnetic moment you can think of as being like an intrinsic magnetism um, that all subatomic particles have. Uh, one of the videos that I'm gonna link to you, link you to in the uh, classroom posting talks about this a lot. Um, they refer to the magnetic moment as a tiny magnet. And that's a fine way of thinking about it too. Um, you can just kind of imagine, um, this is a model only, of course, but you can imagine that subatomic particles are like little tiny bar magnets. And so they just intrinsically have a small magnetic field, even when they're not moving. But if they are moving, then they also have this motion related magnetic field. Um, and so the total field would be the sum of both of those. Now, magnetic field, just like electric field, is a vector. Um, and when it comes to magnetism, there is a lot of stuff with uh, perpendicular vectors. So you're going to frequently run into a case where like you have a velocity vector for a moving particle. Um, and then you also have a like vector for the magnetic field and then 
the force exerted on that particle is going to be perpendicular to both of those, for example. Um, so it's kind of an intrinsically three-dimensional phenomenon, which means that when we're drawing diagrams, it's not going to be good enough to just draw arrows that are on the page because um, if I have like an arrow that's pointing up and another one that's pointing to the side, I might also need to draw a vector or an arrow that's coming like straight out of the paper like this or is going straight into the paper like this. And so the way we represent that is shown at the bottom of this slide. If you imagine the vector is literally being like an arrow, kind of arrow that you would shoot out of a bow, if that arrow is pointing away from you, what you're going to be looking at is the tail feathers or the fletching. And so we represent that with an X. Usually people draw a circle around the X um, if it's just a single vector. If you're trying to draw like a whole field of a whole bunch of Xs, uh, we often get lazy and don't put the circles around them, but the X part is the important part. And then conversely, if the arrow is pointing straight at you, what you're going to be looking at is the arrowhead or the, the tip, the point. And so we represent that with a dot or a dot surrounded by a circle. So again, the upper symbol here, that is the tail feathers of the arrow. That means the arrow is pointing away. And the lower symbol is showing the point of the arrowhead. And that represents a vector that's pointing towards you. So you're going to see a lot of those symbols uh, throughout all of the magnetism stuff that we cover. OK, <clears throat> so one difference between magnetic fields and electric fields is that when we studied electric fields and we're drawing diagrams of those, you might remember that field lines would start on a positively charged particle. So if I have like a proton here, you might have a field line that starts on the particle, comes out of it, and then goes over. And then if there's like an electron over here, the field line connects them. And it like starts and stops in those two different spots. But that is different with magnetism because all magnetic field lines are going to be a completely closed shape, forms a complete loop, does not start on a north pole and end on a south pole, for example. Um, it's a continuous line, a complete loop. Now, I have a diagram here showing a bar magnet and some of the field lines produced by that bar magnet. And so if you could not actually see inside the bar, it might look superficially like the electric field you would get from an electric dipole with a positive and a negative particle nearby. Because here at the North Pole, you can see these lines and they seem to be coming out of the North Pole. If you look down near the South Pole, all the lines seem to be going into it. But the important distinction is that even when these field lines go into the South Pole, they don't actually stop. A single line continues straight through the South Pole region, through the entire bar magnet, and then comes out on the other side again. So it's always a complete loop. And when it comes to a bar magnet or other permanent magnets, the origin of this magnetic field is related to those magnetic moments, the intrinsic magnetism of the subatomic particles that uh, comprise the bar magnet. So in most objects, those magnetic moments are just sort of oriented randomly. So some of them go that way, some go that way, etc. And because they're all randomly arranged, um, they end up not really adding up to much. They kind of cancel out. But in an object that is a permanent magnet, on average, those magnetic moments are lined up with each other. So I've illustrated that here. This is again just a bar magnet. And all these little diamonds are like little tiny compass needles uh, to represent the alignment of the particles in different parts of the magnet. <clears throat> so on average, they're all pointing in the same direction. And that means that their magnetic fields kind of reinforce each other and they build up to create the overall magnetic field that you see above. And uh, again, one of the videos that I'm going to link you to 
talks about this a lot. It's also covered in the third section of the book that I mentioned in the Google Docs, section 12. All right. <clears throat> so because of this difference between electric and magnetic fields, uh, that the magnetic fields are always closed loops. When you look at magnetic fields in the real world, there's usually going to be a lot of curved lines. Um, now, that's often the case with electric fields also, but it's almost unavoidable when it comes to magnetism. Um, in physics problems, you'll still see a lot of questions about uniform fields because they're easy to think about, but they're not very realistic. Um, so these images are pictures of activity near the surface of the sun. These were taken by a, a, a very successful NASA satellite called SOHO that studied uh, the surface of the sun for a long time. And the glowing lines are basically showing you what the magnetic field of the sun looks like. Um, and you can tell it's very complicated. <laughs> um, so anytime plasma gets like thrown up from the surface of the sun up into space, because plasma is all charged particles, those charged particles are influenced very heavily by the sun's magnetic field. Uh, you can almost think about the magnetic field lines as uh, providing like a, a path for the particles that the particles are kind of trapped on. So each one of those bright lines represents a group of magnetic field lines and you can see the plasma as it flows through um, those field lines, uh, almost like a, a pipe or a tube that the plasma flows through, but it's all caused by magnetism instead. Um, <clears throat> The next picture is a little bit of a joke, but this is a still shot from X-Men Apocalypse, which is not an especially good movie. Uh, but there's a scene where Magneto's powers are being uh, enhanced or reawakened by Apocalypse. And if you can't see it clearly in this video, um, you can look at the slides directly. And you should be able to see a dipole field pattern here in the dust. It looks a lot better in animation as well. Um, but whoever designed the special effects for this shot must have been familiar with what a magnetic field looks like and they uh, designed the effects around it. I may have gotten very excited when I first saw that scene and shouted out <laughs> in excitement. Um, but it has exactly the same shape. Uh, as the dipole fields uh, shown here, for example. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about is all of this um, perpendicular vector stuff. It's all related to something called the right-hand rule. And depending on what math you've taken, you might have heard of right-hand rules before. Um, so, <clears throat> for example, to make a math example out of this, Suppose I have like a horizontal plane in front of me, and I'm going to say that that's the xy plane. I know that the z direction is perpendicular to that, but even once I have this plane, there are two directions that would be perpendicular to it. So how am I supposed to know, is the z direction this way or is it this way? And the way that we decide on that is a convention that we've agreed to call the right-hand rule. So we usually make our coordinate systems right-handed, which means that if you know the direction of x and y, so suppose x goes that way and y goes towards you like this, the way you would determine the correct direction for z is with your right hand, you would point all of your fingers initially in the x direction, and then you need to sort of curl your fingers so that they aren't pointing in the y direction. And I said the y direction was towards the camera like this. So I'm gonna have to reposition myself for this. That's the x direction. The y direction is that way towards the camera. 
So then my thumb tells me where the positive z direction is. If I did this with my left hand, I would get the opposite. That's the x direction. I said y was towards the camera, like that. So with my left hand, I get the opposite answer. As long as I'm using my right hand, I'm always going to get the same way. And as long as everybody uses their right hand, then we'll all get the same way. <clears throat> so that's the sort of fundamental right hand rule that all other right hand rules are descended from. Uh, the example here this is a right hand rule that helps you figure out, based on an electric current, which direction does the magnetic field go. Magnetic field is always going to be like little circles that surround the current, but there's still a direction to them. So you need to know, like, does it go clockwise or does it go counterclockwise, for example. So in the first example here, um, there is a circular wire and current is flowing around that wire. You can see that it's going down at the front and then at the back, uh, the current is going up. And there's a person holding onto the loop of wire. They have their fingers wrapped around the wire and their thumb is pointing in the direction that the current is going. So the thumb and I, the current, point in the same direction. If you do that, then the direction that your fingers are pointing, the direction that your fingers curl around the wire, that's the same as the direction of the magnetic field. So these blue arrows here represent the direction of the field, and they're going the same way as the person's fingers. Now each one of these field lines technically should be continuous, so it would like wrap around up here and then come back again on the other side, so that it makes a complete loop. But it's going to be um, it's going to be going in that direction, the direction of the person's fingers. <clears throat> it just occurred to me that when I was doing that right hand rule example, it probably looked my like look probably looked like my left hand because my webcam is set to mirror. Uh, so that's going to be confusing. But try it with your actual right hand and you should get the same results that I said. Um, okay, so then in the second diagram, same basic idea applies. They have a straight wire this time instead of a looped wire. But you can see again, the person has wrapped their fingers around the wire with their thumb pointing in the direction of the current. And the magnetic field, again, makes circles or loops that go around the wire and they have to go in the same direction as the person's fingers. So on this side, that's coming out of the screen, and then on this side, it's going into the screen. And again, out of the screen is a dot, into the screen is an X. So that's the basic idea for determining the direction. And then the diagram at the bottom is just a comparison. Um, again, a bar magnet and the dipole field produced by the magnet. And on the left is basically an electromagnet. It's a, a coil of wire, a long coil, instead of just a single loop that you see in the top half of the screen. Um, it's also called a solenoid when you have a long coil of wire like that. Um, and the field produced by a solenoid, by a long coil, is exactly the same shape as the field produced by a bar magnet. Um, and so again, that shows some conceptual connection between the motion of charged particles that you see in the current and the intrinsic magnetism of the particles themselves, the magnetic moments of the particles uh, that make up the bar magnet. So all magnetic fields are ultimately produced by a the addition of a whole bunch of dipole fields. Um, and if all of those dipoles are aligned with each other, like a bunch of particles in a bar magnet or a bunch of individual loops in a coil, they're all facing the same way. Um, in either case, you're going to get the same resulting field shape. So 
that is all I've got for the slides. Um, <clears throat> that should be enough to help you with a bunch of the questions in the classwork, but not all of them. So you will also need to um, watch the YouTube videos, the minute physics videos specifically. Uh, you'll need to watch that and or uh, read up on some of this stuff, either in our textbook or in some other source um, in order to answer some of those questions. But if you get stuck on anything, um, you're welcome to come into my office hours, Tuesday or Friday. The assignment will be due um, Friday evening to make sure that you've had the chance to come and talk to me about it if you want to. And that is it. So I hope everyone's doing well. Uh, and I will communicate with you again. <laughs>